So uh, I just want to welcome everybody and make a, uh, a very few uh, preliminary remarks, sort of framing what we're about here. Um, we've, in cognitive neuroscience, we I've been in this business a long time, uh, as you can see. Uh, and so I look both backward, but uh, also particularly in this workshop, uh, I, I, we brought everybody together to look forward. Um, when I look backward, I think, well, we've come a long way. Uh, and I want to give you a very brief little, little flavor of where we've come from. Uh, in my second published paper, when I was still a graduate student, um, the behaviorism still reigned uh, very strongly. We're talking here the mid-60s. Uh, and uh, I had a sentence in this paper, which had been accepted, that said, brain stimulation reward causes the animal to seek out more brain stimulation reward. And the editor of the journal, Bill Estes, who was a very, very smart man, uh, but uh, a behaviorist, although he later uh, made quite significant contributions to the development of cognitive science, but he struck through, <coughs> seek out, and he wrote a little character that said, unscientific. <laughs> and so I replaced it, and I, I literally had my tongue in my cheek. Uh, I replaced it with the following. Uh, it causes the, it, it increases the probability of the animal emitting responses that produce brain stimulation reward. <laughs> and he said, that's the way it went to press. Uh, it was never clear to me whether Bill knew that I was trolling him or, uh, or not. Uh, but that was sort of uh, where we were in the mid-1960s and now turning to where we were on the neuroscience side. Um, uh, there was a fellow in Michigan, as I recall, Isaacson, if I recall the name correctly, who was quite prominent on his theory of the hippocampus. And his theory of the function of the hippocampus was that it mediated inhibition. <laughs> you say, well, yes, I don't know. That's the beginning of the theory. No, that was the theory. <laughs> well, behavior, you had to either excite behaviors or you inhibited behaviors, and what the hippocampus did was inhibit them. So I, I think when we look now, we, uh, we've made progress. Uh, and uh, I think, for me at least, certainly, this progress is encapsulated in, uh, in the title of this workshop, which is Cognition, uh, Computation in the Brain. I think it was actually Computation, Cognition in the Brain, but for my purposes, I want to slightly rearrange that order. And for me, and I think for many of us, but perhaps not all of us, um, the the current frame, uh, intellectual framework was uh, nicely uh, and in very influentially articulated in David Marr's famous uh, book on vision, in which he said, look, uh, first of all, his first argument was that you, uh, a computational analysis is the necessary framework language and so on to link uh, perceptual and thought and uh, action uh, phenomena to processes in the brain. And that was, in, in its day, very controversial. But he went on to say, and in any sort of computational analysis, we can recognize three uh, levels. One is the computational representational level, in which we try to say, what has the brain computed? And, and what is it representing uh, about its experience that enables it to act in the way in which it observably does act. That was the first level. That's roughly the level at which uh, cognitive psychologists uh, operate. The second level was the, uh, in Mars' famous trilogy, was the uh, algorithmic level, which was, uh, so how does it compute it? That is, uh, at the sort of flow diagram level at which a computer programmer would uh, work. First, we're going to compute this. We're going to use this set of functions in order to compute that. Then we're going to compute this, and we're going to compute that. And when we're done, we'll have what it is we're trying to compute. That was the algorithmic. Still is the algorithmic level. And finally, uh, Mark said, and then there's the implementation level. Uh, if Once we've agreed that this is the sequence of computational operations that the brain is executing, then the question is, yeah, well, so how do you do those operations using neurons? Um, so that brings me to looking forward. And when I look forward, um, so when I look back, I say, well, we've come a long way. When I look forward, I think, whoa, we've hardly started. Um, because uh, we 
we have, at least in my view, and I think probably in the view of most of the people who will be participating in this workshop, we haven't answered in any way that commands wide consensus. Uh, most of the most obvious and most fundamental questions at any of uh, these levels. For example, at the computational level, we haven't agreed upon whether the brain uh, represents the world symbolically or whether it represents it sub symbolically. At the, uh, at the uh, algorithmic level, we haven't agreed, we've barely even discussed the question of what are the primitive op uh, computational operations in the brain. I mean, presumably the genes specify some sort of bedrock set of uh, combinatorial computational operations that neural tissue can carry out, and the rest of the system is built on uh, those foundations. But if, uh, if you're a smart aleck in a course in neuroscience and you ask someone, well, what is the... Uh, equivalent of the periodic table for uh, computational neuroscience and what are the foundational. The elementary, I don't think, uh, I think you'll get stammering and hand-waving and uh, there's certainly no consensus unless it has escaped me. Um, for example, uh, it seems to me beyond reasonable dispute that the brain has a way of adding uh, two quantities. That is that it uh, performs the basic arithmetic operations, and that this is almost certainly primitive. But how the neural tissue actually adds, uh, well, that's a question that I hope to gain some insight uh, on in this meeting. Um, now, uh, returning to the implementation uh, uh, level, uh, one of the things that we've agreed upon at the computational level, and this is serious progress, this unthought of when I was in graduate school, is that a fundamental computation in the navigation of animals all the way from human beings down to insects is dead reckoning. And dead reckoning, or path integration, uh, so it's more technically called, is simply adding up your displacements so that the sum of your small displacements uh, is your net displacement, and your net displacement gives you where you are now compared to where you were when you began this uh, calculation. Um, so uh, there's agreement, but it's consensus I mean, in navigation as in every scientific field. There's a huge amount of argument, but everyone agrees, oh yeah, all these animals are dead reckoning. So they're keeping a running sum. Well, we turn to the implementational level and we ask, yeah, so what's the neural mechanism that enables uh, the brain of a fly or a bee or an ant to uh, keep a running uh, sum, uh, then we begin to stammer. So our task uh, here in this workshop is to survey the lay of the land as it is now, try to look ahead into all that unconquered territory, and to take stock of where where are we exactly. That's in any survey the first I used to work as a surveyor. <laughs> the first thing is to figure out where you are. <laughs> and, then, and then you start saying, okay, now that I know where I am, let's uh, try to look ahead here and figure out where we might lay the roads and what brush we want, need to cut through. Um, and uh, we hope this, that this workshop will contribute to our both uh, taking stock of where we are and where we think the roads ahead uh, to be built, where they, where they lie, where in this terrain. Uh, before I relinquish the podium to David, who will, uh, to David Vicario, who will uh, introduce the first uh, session, I want to give a shout out to uh, Sarah Pixley, whose uh, formidable enthusiasm and uh, energy and organizational skill has, uh, has made this uh, possible. Uh, David and Dimitri and Brian and I are listed on the programmer as the organizers, and we did all in our way make uh, uh, contributions, but it would have happened without uh, any one of us. But without Sarah, it wouldn't have happened. So uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Sarah. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, David Perio. Uh, I have the uh, distinction for one more year of being the chair of the psychology department here at Rutgers. 
Um, I want to second uh, Randy's thank you and extend it a little bit. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, uh, Brian, Dimitri, and Randy uh, did pull uh, the weight of this as well. And in addition to Sarah, uh, the uh, staffs of the Computer Science Department and the Psychology Department uh, and the Rutgers Center for Cognitive Science uh, all did yeoman service uh, in terms of uh, all logistics for pulling together a meeting of this sort. Uh, in addition, uh, I, I want to thank uh, our uh, funders and providers of resources, the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, and in particular, the Chancellor's Office of the New Brunswick campus that provided the bulk of the funding uh, that made uh, this possible. Uh, and I want to thank you all uh, for showing up. I think we're going to have a good time. The genesis of uh, this conference, in my mind, uh, began with a graduate seminar offered by Randy, myself, John McGann, who is somewhere in the audience, and Liz Torres, I don't see her right now, uh, in which we address the question of how is the world represented in the brain? Right? And we uh, ask that question intentionally in two ways. What is the neurobiological model, and what is the cognitivist model for representation, because that word is used in both of these fields of, larger fields of neuroscience, right? And we're all, I think, uh, familiar with the, uh, the sort of discoveries motivated by the observations of people in Weasel and others about the way in which physical parameters of the world impinging on the sense organs uh, were then uh, broken down or abstracted in some way uh, that represented the sensory epithelium, be it the retina, be it the cochlea, be it the surface of the body, olfaction may be another question, John, uh, how uh, elements of that physical flux uh, got into the nervous system, and then how those elemental events were assembled into things like uh, orientation columns and hypercomplex uh, cells and the extraction of, of uh, pitch and things like this. Okay, so that there was this hierarchical process that was essentially bottom-up uh, that via the, the particular characteristics of the sense organs broke the world and its states down into component parts that then were reassembled in some kind of hierarchical process in the central nervous system. Um, on the cognitivist side, the notion was the world has structure and the world has states, and the job of the brain is to determine what the current state of the world is, so that operations like the brain was talking about can be performed uh, on this. Now, there's no reason that these two ways of talking about it, a bottom-up one that comes starts with a physical flux and a top-down one which starts with some kind of a world model are in any way in conflict. On the other hand, people who tend to work in one field or another have tended not to talk to the other or to see the cognitive people as modelers or something like that. Uh, and the cognitive people say, the neurobiologists, well, they're, they're in the hardware. They don't understand the software. Right? So this has been a conflict, which we tried to address uh, with a, a group of willing graduate students and faculty in this, in this uh, seminar. Um, and uh, we made not an enormous amount of progress, but, but we began to sort of understand and perhaps begin to see how these levels of analysis uh, might um, interact. One of the problems not addressed by either of those uh, is the problem which we sort of generically call learning and memory, whatever those are. In other words, uh, in the neurobiological case, it's not the case that everything is static. We have this thing called neuroplasticity, whatever that is, and synaptic modification, whatever that is, right? These are real phenomena, but exactly how they relate um, to building higher order properties that are not based on a direct linear combination of the elemental pieces of sensory experience, uh, but instead uh, on uh, combinatorial states of the world that are represented by associative events in the nervous system. I don't necessarily mean stimulus-response association, I mean co-occurrence of activity. 
right? So there is a model for uh, changing the organization of the hierarchical system within neurobiology that comes from such a uh, way of thinking about it. And in the cognitive world, uh, the organism may come with certain kinds of priors. Now, for instance, Randy just suggested that there is a bedrock prior algorithm for adding things up, or perhaps for dead reckoning, or perhaps evolution gave the brains this capability because it was so uh, essential for exactly how those priors, if you may call them, get updated in the brain <coughs> remains a problem uh, for cognitive science as well. There's a sort of Bayesian interpretation of the brain, etc. But anyway, those are the kinds of ideas that we were talking about and that led to the idea for this conference. Now, as that was taking place, I don't know what it was, six, seven years ago, uh, whatever, at the same time, we became increasingly aware, everyone was becoming increasingly aware, of the power of a pure computational approach to solve comparable problems in computer science. Uh, we now call it AI, or deep learning, or something like that, right? Um, and so Randy and I joined forces with uh, Dimitri Metaxas uh, uh, in computer science and to produce a proposal that we um, uh, offered to the chancellor for funding. Uh, and this is some of the verbiage from that proposal. I can't read it. Okay? You probably can. Um, Basically, I think I'll read the first sentence, sort of, computational neuroscience seeks to understand how the brain combines sensory input together with prior experience and ongoing goals to choose and shape adaptive behaviors. Recent advances in modern neurobiology and computer science, both conceptual and technical, now enable new approaches to this fundamental problem. I do not necessarily have to agree with this, but this, uh, this language and the final sentence uh, convinced the chancellor to give us a bunch uh, of money uh, to support, to bring people here, to put us here, right? So, I've sort of laid out some kind of general landscape of what the questions were that motivated us, and that meant that as a, a uh, committee, uh, we through planning the actual conference, once it was funded, uh, we needed to uh, think about what we would talk about and how uh, we would organize it. And this is the same as in your program. I don't know, I don't see people having programs, but in any case, uh, today uh, we have uh, a couple of sessions. The first one is called Processing Levels. Uh, what mechanisms for encoding experiential statistics operate at the circuit versus uh, cellular levels? And we'll be starting that session in a moment. Uh, then uh, this afternoon, I guess, uh, we'll talk about the problem of decision making. Uh, then uh, tomorrow, space and time. I mean, what else is there, right? Uh, higher visual perception. There is a way that our thinking about these problems in neuroscience, and an awful lot of the work has been driven by visual metaphors because they come to us as highly uh, visual animals. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we should always bear in mind that uh, the motor side, the output side, the behavioral side, uh, is, a, is a, a complement or the equal sister uh, to, to this, and that as we think uh, in sensory terms, we also have to think uh, in, in motor terms. And I'll make another comment uh, about that, and I think that will come up in uh, one or both of the talks that we're about uh, to hear. And finally, in coding theory, uh, kind of what are the computational mechanisms? This relates most closely to what Randy said and to the intersection with modern uh, computer theory. <coughs> now, in planning the conference, we broke it. You might want to have different themes, but these are the themes we came up with. I think they actually are all facets in some way of the same problem. But uh, we didn't want to have another conference where a bunch of brilliant people told us about their exciting results hour after hour after hour, and we were excited and exhausted. We wanted to have something more interactive. So we have very few speakers. Uh, and we've tried to allow enough time for discussion and enough days of the conference that this is not just a big explosion of data. Uh, and therefore, we've encouraged the speakers uh, to try and put whatever their exciting results are into the framework of 
some big questions, right, of the sort that Randy uh, alluded to. Uh, I don't think we're going to answer any of these questions, but we did come up with a, uh, some questions, quite a long list, that we gave to the speakers for them to consider in planning their talk. Uh, and perhaps in the audience, uh, people will generate their own questions. Perhaps the speakers will ignore our questions and uh, discuss their own. I, I do not know. Uh, so uh, just a quick uh, look through here. For instance, processing levels. Well. When events are experienced, should we be thinking of cells with identities doing something? Should we be thinking of circuits of cells that somehow interact, population codes and stuff like that? Or perhaps intracellular events. There's, uh, there are little tantalizing bits of information coming out in the last few years that there may be a significant participation of intracellular events or glial events. Uh, that even though glia don't spike, they condition the intercellular environment uh, in ways that affect um, certain ions that we already know, like calcium, which are uh, important uh, for what we think of as memory processes. Uh, I, don't, I won't go through all of this, but uh, there's parallel processing. What does that mean? How do the parallel processes get together? The classic statement of this is the, the binding problem in object recognition, right? In the case of audition, or many events actually unroll, significant events unroll in time, but audition in the classic, in that a single point sample of the auditory stream doesn't tell you much, right? You actually have to listen for a while. So there's intrinsically a rolling buffer of some kind that has to be analyzed and yet turn into the detection of a state of the world. Decision making, well, kind of, this kind of like important. People make a lot of bad decisions and hopefully a few good ones, right? So what, on what evidence do people make decisions and how does that work? Is it in the firing of neurons? Is it some motivational thing? Is it the interaction between what we want and what we know? Uh, there's a, a great deal of modeling uh, around this uh, that's come out of psychological fields. Uh, can computers, uh, make, do we learn something from computers about how decisions are made? I'm not going to read every word here, but what do we mean about the accumulation of evidence uh, that actually leads to some critical state that uh, causes a, st a state of the world detected by the sensory systems interacting with the goal state of the animal that actually causes a behavior to be knitted, right? Uh, these are some of the questions here in space and time that Randy addressed that are sort of fundamental to an organism uh, in the environment. How are these things represented? You already introduced that. But there's a question of how they're represented at the moment when you're having the experience of them. And then there's a question of how you put them into memory, which is the learning and memory question, which may not be quite the same as how they're experienced uh, in real time, and then of course that also leads to uh, questions of retrieval and stuff like that. The visual metaphor I've already referred to as being incredibly useful, so to speak. Uh, the question is, is there something general? Uh, Darth Sao has some very interesting results on the parameter space in which macaque faces are coded. Uh, how general might uh, that, I mean, we can all sort of say, oh gee, there's this multidimensional space and stuff like that, but how, how powerful and how general is that? Or is that some artifact of the way uh, we think about things as, as mathematicians? Uh, I don't know. And how, while it's reasonable to think that certain parameters of the face, after all, face recognition software works brilliantly, certain parameters can be abstracted and used to recognize faces, but how general might that be for the other big problem that animals solve, it's who they're with, and where they are, and where is home, etc. the cognitive map of space. Is there some way that that's parameterized? Like the distance between the eyes and where your nose is and stuff like that, right? Um, and finally, encoding theory, which is, so to speak, uh, where uh, software and the brain's instantiation of algorithms uh, meet. Right? Uh, I think these are, uh, there's a question of the two way street. How do we use what we know about human memory to make better computer algorithms? And 
if, is there something about the way deep learning has been so successful uh, that gives us clues about the fundamental information processing uh, problem that the brain solves? Are the methods, the internal plumbing of computational neural networks, the same? Okay, uh, unfortunately, the third speaker, every session was intended to have experimentalists and uh, theorists. And this first session, uh, Dan Margoliash, Michael Long, were supposed to be complimented by Adrian Fairhall, who comes out of the world uh, of physics and brings a computational and modeling approach. Unfortunately, for personal reasons, uh, she had to drop out uh, recently. We were unable really to find a suitable replacement, but I do want to uh, shine a little bit of a light on the kinds of things she might have said based on some sort of review or editorials that she wrote in Current Opinion in Neurobiology. Um, these thoughts here are not necessarily original to her. Other people have had these thoughts, but um, I just want to sort of channel her voice a little bit. Right? Um, so, uh, in a, an issue of Current Opinion in Neurobiology that she edited, she talks about computational neuroscience, theory, modeling, and data analysis, right? That's data analysis, I guess, where uh, experimental and computational approaches. There's the central truth that neural networks are driven nonlinear dynamical systems. Now, this could easily be applied to uh, machine learning systems, but I think we should see that as not just a metaphor for thinking about um, how large groups of neurons uh, work together. Uh, so the neural networks could be a physical neural network or it could be a computational neural network. The identification of solu tractor solutions that might lead to uh, decisions uh, is at the heart of classic theory of computation. And then such as memory, robust coding, long time scale interaction, integration, and decision making. Well, this is what the brain does, right? Uh, and now artificial neural networks can generate complex uh, behaviors has now expanded the space of possibilities. This relates to the encoding idea. A couple of other ideas, which I think many of us have thought about, uh, are also addressed sort of very uh, articulately by, by uh, her and her collaborators in this paper from 2016 about dimensionality reduction, right? Uh, a visual scene may be overflowing with information, such as reaching for the television remote, however, requires the extraction of only a very small fraction of what's out there, right? Uh, we could care about an infinite number of visual patterns, the entire possible multidimensional space, but we don't. We can distinguish actor spaces with ease, but uh, it's very difficult to distinguish two different images of television static, even though those might be equally different in some mathematical sense as the two active spaces, and yet we are pre-programmed by evolution or by statistical learning experience to be able to solve some problems very, very easily and to see which part of the parameter space we should be operating in to solve our immediate problem. And here she addresses the motor complement we could respond with an almost infinite number of movements, but we don't. Uh, the motions that we execute are highly stereotyped and related to grasping motions. So there's some kind of finding of a place in multidimensional space on the sensory side, and there's some kind of finding of a place of motor synergies uh, on the motor side. So we might want to think about how the brain performs uh, these kinds of dimensionality reductions. Uh, finally, in kind of a cutely titled paper, The Receptive Field is Dead, Long Live the Receptive Field, uh, she uh, makes uh, the kind of point that I made earlier uh, with respect to neurobiological versus cognitivist approaches, uh, the notion of a hierarchical building, right, which has been tremendously successful, uh, as uh, she says, this has been gained powerful traction because, in fact, the responses are intelligible in terms of the physical parameters of the flux that the organism is in. Uh, but there are problems. The success of the basic receptive field model is based on the stimuli that you play. It's the drunk looking where the light is. Now, that problem was recognized after a while. How to make bigger basis sets. 
basis sets that really cover whatever the relevant space is. Then along came reverse correlation, where we, we throw what we think is the entire basis at the brain, and we ask spikes to tell us what's going on, what they like. But even that is a kind of a static formulation that there is a pattern which those neurons respond to, and they're going to tell us what it is. But that ignores the circuit level, the fact that how they respond to that pattern not only may depend on the other components, uh, such that simple receptive, receptive fields determined with simple stimuli don't add up to what you see with complex stimuli, and completely ignore the context and the history of those neurons. So there are serious uh, caveats, and the question is, uh, how do we get to a, a formulation which is not driven by the limits of our methods, but so to speak by the limits of our imagination uh, about this? So, I think those are things that I think about as I come into the question of uh, neural coding. So I think I will uh, quit there and turn the uh, podium over to my esteemed colleague and longtime friend, 1981, uh, who has the distinction of his PhD thesis having the subtitle, in the subtitle, the word grandmothers, I believe my correct. Right. That is to say, grandmother cells. That is to say, cells that perform a level of abstraction on the input, which causes them to represent an ethologically relevant quantity, assuming depending on how you feel about uh, your grandmother's ethological object. Okay.